All right. Um, we're moving into our first major conversation for today, and that is the cabinet reshuffle by President Muhammad Buhari. He has fired two ministers, the Minister of Power and Agriculture, and replaced them. Um, in, of course, uh, it has been described as, you know, the steps being taken because they were underperforming ministers. This morning, we are speaking with Mark Adebayo, who is a public affairs analyst, and Mr. Ayodele Adio, who is a managing director of the Avalon uh, here in Nigeria. Good morning to you both. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, Mr. Adeboy, I'll start with you. I, I want to get your thoughts on this story generally. When you heard um, you know, the news that these two people have been fired, uh, do you see this as great news in the steps towards achieving you know, better for Nigeria? Uh, well, my first impression was that, well, uh, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is constitutionally empowered to appoint ministers and to, and to relieve them of their appointments. He has the power of hire and fire over all his appointees. So, um, but physically speaking for me, it's a, it's a non-event. But it is something that uh, I only hope that uh, those he's replacing them with would uh, do something better. Well, the, for, in the area of uh, the Minister of Power, for instance, it's, it's difficult to be able to point out that any achievement, any sterling performance that he has been able to achieve uh, since he came into office. You know, what we have seen is that uh, for the last two years, four years, even before he came into office, uh, electricity tariff has been increased by about 400% without corresponding deliverables to, to, to Nigerians. You don't, you don't see uh, power is far and in between. There is no deliverable. There is no, you know, the issue of power in Nigeria is like it's degenerating by the day in the area of generation, in the area of distribution. So uh, there, there was nothing the Minister of Power did that was that didn't that couldn't have warranted him being relieved of his appointment. In the area of agriculture, you would discover that things, food is extremely expensive now. You know. When, as a, as a family man, where you used to put uh, 20,000 20, naira down now, now you have to put something uh, like 50 to 60,000 naira. For upkeep, for, for just to buy food for one week, it's, uh, it's extremely expensive. So a lot of uh, hunger in the land, which is causing a lot of hunger. But for me, the president did not go far enough. The president did not go far enough. Okay, what do you, what do you say about the health minister? Now the National uh, Association of Resident Doctors of Nigeria have been in the uh, on strike for about three or so weeks now. Hundreds of Nigerians have died because of that. And then, you know, right here in our shores, right there in our country, right there in the in the federal capital territory, Nigerian doctors in their hundreds were keen yeah. up to get job from another country, Saudi Arabia. I mean, it, it tells you that the Nigerian health sector is in crisis. What is that minister still doing there? Now, we have a minister that has been alleged, you know, to, to have, a, you know, terrorism sympathy. Who is still in the government? I was thinking that those ministers should, should go. The health minister, the communication minister, because once there's an, a serious allegation against you like that, you have to be, you, you, you have to go, you know. So, the, the, the reshuffling did not go far enough. The, the, the president needs to look at critical area. Look at the area of defense, you know, which is responsible for our security. What, what has the, what, what the president should look critical? Everybody, everybody involved in the security management of this country ought, ought, ought to go, ought to be replaced. Okay, you Mr. Understand? Adebayo. So, um, let's quickly bring in Mr. Adio um, to get your initial reaction to this cabinet reshuffle by the president. I think it was a very important move by the president because these were two ministries that have quite frankly been underperforming in the last two years. Now, if you talk about the agricultural sector, um, you know, Mr. Adebayo alluded to the fact that food prices have been skyrocketing. Of course, that is not directly the fault of the minister, um, but you would have expected um, some strategic response from that ministry in terms of certain policies um, and initiatives that would have driven the agricultural sector forward, which did not happen. You would, you would realize that in the last few years, the agricultural sector has been the engine of growth um, of our economy. It's been growing steadily over the last few years. Um, but in recent times, the agricultural 
health sector has been shrinking. In fact, for the last two years, our economy has um, enjoyed a boost largely from the information technology sector, whereas the agricultural sector has been shrinking. So it points clearly um, that there's a problem with the leadership in that particular uh, uh, sector. So to that extent, it, it seems like a very sensible um, decision for me. On the part of the power sector, I mean, it's clear to everyone. In 2017, um, the former minister of power had initiated um, some sort of a strategic roadmap called the Power Sector Recovery Plan, which, amongst other things, was to do three critical things, which was to increase power supply, um, you know, to make the sector more robust and attractive to private sector investment, and to make the sector financially viable. Um, and that, that roadmap was to run up to 2021, such that even the World Bank was willing to provide a counterpart funding of $2.5 billion. Um, unfortunately, um, when this new minister came in, the biggest mistake he did was not to stick to that particular roadmap and decided to reinvent the wheel uh, and pursue policies that were counter to the roadmap that had been laid on the ground. And what did that give us? That continued to give us frequent uh, uh, grid collapses, higher electricity tariff, uh, uh, and very result, very little results uh, uh, to show for it. Um, but thankfully, um, uh, 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 the, the president has found the courage um, to do the right thing, um, even though many would argue it's coming at the eighth day of the week. Uh, but thankfully, he's done the right thing. And we can only hope that the two people that have been replaced in those both ministries um, will, will chart the course uh, forward. Well, we'll get to talk about that, you know, and also look at these two people who are replacing the ones fired and seeing how much, you know, they've also performed where they're coming from. But, um, Mr. Um, Adio, there's something, you know, that I feel, you know, and I've said here before that, you know, a lot of times we don't have, you know, actual indices for rating the performance of people in government. And that includes, you know, not just ministers and everybody who's in charge of any MDA, even, you know, governors and presidents themselves, there's no actual indices for rating, you know, how they perform. So I want you to share your thoughts on how you rate a performing minister. In what ways can you properly rate a performing minister? And how long should it take before a government realizes this person doesn't seem to be doing well enough? Um, it's time to make a change. Well, I would not. I would argue that um, there are ways, there are standard ways to evaluate people who hold political offices. The only difference is that because um, usually political offices is more emotional, and once you connect to people emotionally, um, you blur the lines of how to really evaluate you in terms of the work that you have done um, on the ground. But you know, to the extent of the question that you've asked, I think there are clear ways to evaluate a minister. One um, is is first a strategic. Um, agenda and the policy direction that the ministry sets, um, how clear that vision is, uh, what the objectives are and how achievable those objectives are. Uh, 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 you also have to look at how well that ministry had implemented that plan and consequently the results of the policies that that particular minister had pursued um, over that critical period of time. And so you are able to access that given the context of the budgetary allocation available to that particular ministry. Uh, uh, so for instance, in the power sector, you can measure it um, by the, the, the amount of investments that have come into the private sector um, to improve transmission capacity, to improve generation capacity, to improve distribution capacity. You can measure that the amount of uh, electricity supply that the average Nigeria uh, now has. You can evaluate that by how cheap and affordable the power supply is, especially for the manufacturing sector, to be able to produce and become globally competitive. So there are clear indices for which you can evaluate certain ministries or departments of government. Now, the only problem is that people like to be a lot more emotional um, than they are at looking at the numbers. And if we look closely at the numbers, you will see that these particular two ministers have dropped the ball. And if you went to the streets in Yaba, or in, or in TBS or, or, or anywhere in Lagos, and you put a microphone on anybody's mouth, they will tell you clearly that there have been a problem with these two ministries, uh, these two ministries, and the results are clear for everyone to see that they have quite underperformed. And it's a courageous thing for the president um, yeah. to change, to change, do a quick substitute, and well, to see if they can in, salvage. In about twenty um, seconds, in twenty involved. seconds, um, how long would you expect a change to be made when a minister is underperforming? 
Well, I mean, that's, a, that's quite a difficult question, but I, I think that a four-year period, I would argue that a four-year period is enough for you to implement an idea and to see it uh, um, to fruition. A four-year four -year time would be, be, be a sensible time. Okay, let's bring in Mr. Adebayo now. Um, we know that um, Nigeria needs about 180,000 to about 200,000 megawatts of electricity, you know, for, of power for us to have stable electricity in Nigeria. But we're currently around 4,000 you know, generating just about 4,000, you know, way, way, way under what we need. And um, when Salim Maman, you know, came into office, he said that he was going to take our power generating capacity to 11,000 megawatts. He then upped that to about 25,000 megawatts. But then we know that we're still highly underperforming. So when we look really at, you know, the gap regarding where we are with power and where we ought to be, um, what do you think the minister, you know, missed out, what he could have done, you know, to make sure that we close that gap? And is, is that going to be possible within the next two years in power? Yeah, thank you, Aneta. You see, the uh, issue is that uh, he probably set a, a bar for himself that he couldn't, he couldn't scale. And uh, it, it's quite clear that uh, he did not have a strategic plan of execution of the bar that he set by for himself. It's like it's like identifying a destination without having a roadmap of how to get to that destination. That was that was what happened to the minister of uh, of power. So I and of course, as my colleague said, you know, he made a plan on ground, discarded it, and started to begin to reinvent the wheel. I'm aware that a few professionals submitted a robust plan of action to him, which is just is jettisoned. I know I know this very well because these professional, these experts are my friends. They, 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 they did a, a, a thorough job, submitted it to him, and he got it, he thanked them, and discarded it. He never did anything about it. So uh, meanwhile, the one he met on ground, he refused to implement. So that is a major, that, that, that is one of his uh, biggest undoings. And uh, I think... Um, uh, when you set a bar for yourself, the, the best it's like setting a question for if you set a question for yourself, you know, uh, when we were in the university, just for the sake of uh, maybe for the fun of it or to discipline students who, who are not in class, you know, a lecturer comes into class and says, um, Write a question for yourself and answer by yourself. You know, he comes, looks at the class, sees that less than 50% of the students are there. He didn't, have, he didn't plan to, to give you a question before, but he just said, okay, so write the question by yourself and answer. It happened to me like twice or so when I was in the university. But if you, how do you now feel a question that you have asked yourself? That is what mm -hmm. has happened to the Minister of Power. Now, he set a bar for himself, he set a standard which he was unable to achieve, and that is not good for us. Everybody, look, I... I I, my son had to put on a generator now. There's no power here. That's not, because you, you also look at, we may be having maybe 4,000 or 5,000 megawatts uh, being generated. What about the distribution? The distribution level itself is still abysmal. It's still abysmal. We, we, we are generating like 4,000 or so, but it is not, how many communities even benefit from that? There are thousands of communities in this country. I read the, I read the material on the electricity distribution in this country. I still know that we, the distribution level is, is abysmal. All right. It's abysmal. Um, so, let's yeah, let, let's bring back um, Ayodele Adio. Um, and, you know, I want us to go to, you know, back, you know, all the way back to the, you know, foundation of all of this. Um, Mr. Mark Adebayo had mentioned other ministries that he believed needed to feel the same effect, you know, and have, um, you know, replacements done. But, um, Mr. Adio, I want you to go back to the initial selection of ministers um, and share your thoughts on the persons that were placed in these, you know, capacities. Um, do you feel like the current administration had done a thorough job or well, had made the best selection uh, of persons to handle these um, um, ministries. And also, um, are there other ministries that you feel you would rate pretty much the same way you've rated the power and uh, agriculture and, and these ministers that have been replaced? Okay, so if I get the question correctly, um, you're not talking about the selection of these new ministers. You're talking about the old ministers. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm talking about yeah. Every the, the initial selection, you know, of ministers, you know, for the current administration, and um, you know, are there other ministries you've also looked at and thought to, and thought to yourself, you know, this person needs also to go, um, or these three I mean, quite, also need to go. Yeah, quite frankly, we haven't put 
put square pegs and square holes in many ministries. Um, in fact, it's easier to count, um, the, you know, the amount of ministers, you know, that are really performing because they won't go past your first um, your first hand. And that's the sad reality. Um, and we can go all and all. And you see, it's so bad that there are so many ministers that you can't even remember their name. You know, you, you don't even know who they are uh, um, in this particular administration. And it's, it's quite a shame. Um, the minister... Um, of, of interior, for instance, who is supposed to be in charge of internal security, um, I think can do a lot more better. Um, I think that um, the Minister of Labour um, has, has, has been quite shocking in many of the things that he has said and many of the things that he has done um, and the way he's handled labour disputes um, over time. Um, I mean, the, the list is just endless because, uh, and that's why that's why we, we seem to be where we are, you know, as a country, because there's too many um, square pegs in a round hole. And um, the process for which many ministers were giving offices, I, I think it was more a reward for political loyalty as against um, uh, competence in a particular role, you know, responsibility that they were given. And, and, and that's, 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 that's a sad situation that, that we find ourselves in. Yes, Mr. Adio, th that point you just mentioned is what I was going to bring up. Um, when we take a look at how appointments are made, especially regarding the cabinet, and does it then seem to you that this is something about politics more than competence and professionalism? Because I took a look at the profiles of these you know, new ministers that have replaced the old ones, and I, it really doesn't seem to match up with the professions and disciplines of these ministers and where they're coming to. For example, we know that um, the new minister, Abubakar Aliyu, former minister of state um, for Federal Ministry of Works and Housing, is a professional engineer. You know, he's now being brought into the power space. Also, we were seeing that uh, Mahmoud Abubakar specialized in microbiology and, um, you know, a mass degrees in resources management. He's now coming into agriculture. So are we still having the same mistakes or are there, you know, um, lessons that they can, you know, bring over to their new ministries to make it work? Mr. Dio and then Mr. Adibayo, please. Okay, uh, so there are two things uh, with people that you appoint to head um, very big governments, agencies, organizations. So it's either they have the technical expertise or they have strong administrative competence. Um, uh, and so the real problem, the real problem happens when they lack both, when they do not have the technical expertise that is required to supervise a ministry, and when they lack administrative competence. Um, now, if you talk about the two ministers who have just been sworn in or who have just been appointed, I, I really can't speak for the Minister of Environment because I really do not know his background. I've really not followed anything. Um, but to the, to the former Minister for State for Housing, um, which I have followed um, for quite some time, incidentally, I met him in 2009 when he was the head of the Yobe State uh, Housing Agency. Um, the truth is, the civil is, is I think he's a civil engineer. Yes, I, um, yes. I, Yes. Um, so it, it, it might not directly, in terms of technical expertise, match the requirement that is required for the power sector. But he's been a seasoned administrator for the past 12, 13, 14 years. Um, and he spent his entire career in government bureaucracies, heading various government agencies at the state level, uh, became deputy governor for about 10 years. Um, and of course, and then minister for state uh, uh, for housing and the works and ministry. So I think that to that extent, and from the few things that I've learned, Learned about him over the years. Um, he, he seems to be a hard worker. Um, he's quite um, a seasoned administrator. Uh, would bring is likely. Uh, let me choose my words carefully. Is likely to bring stability um, to the power sector. And I have the confidence of the fact that because he's worked with um, the former power minister for power, who had set up a roadmap for the power ministry before he was relieved of his duties in 2019. Um, he may he may be more open and willing to continue to pursue the plan or the roadmap um, that was left behind by the former minister and see that um, to completion. So, if there's anything that gives me gives me confidence, um, is the slight um, the slight antecedent of the fact that he's quite a seasoned administrator and might just be willing to follow um, the laid down plan and procedures. Um, on ground. Okay. Um, so fundamentally, you just need two things. I think you need the technical expertise. The perfect scenario would be someone who has the technical expertise 
and the administrative competence. But once you find one of the two, um, you may just be able to model through. But if you have none of the two, then you're going to have yourself in a real, real, real pot of soup. Okay, um, Mr. Debayo, I want you to um, wade in yeah. on this because when we take a look at the cabinets of other mm. countries, for example, um, the Joe Biden cabinet when he announced it, we saw people that he put in, people who are young, vibrant, and people who you know, have ownership and authority of the different sectors that you were plugged in, but it doesn't seem exactly so in Nigeria. Um, how do you react to this regarding, you know, professionalism and um, um, basically politics? Well, you see, you, we, the country will not be able to get it right if all we do is uh, the qualifications and considerations for appointing people into office is political or ethno-religious. And that's what has been happening since the inception of this country. That there is no deliberate attempt to bring in people with expertise, except in a very few, very few, uh, uh, you know, circumstances that we have been able to get this right, like former minister of, of finance in Nigeria, Ngozi Okonjo Iweala. This is a great, this is a great woman who, 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 who was brought in and was able to do wonderfully well. You cannot say that for many people. Uh, late Dr. Uh, Professor Akuyili, uh, you know, look at what he did at uh, in the area of drug management and administration in the country. A set of few, a few occasions like that. And we, are, we have not been lucky. You know, we have people come in through political consideration, and religious uh, sentiments, you know, uh, for which this government is the most notorious. You understand me? Now, if, if I were the president, the minister of finance, uh, of, uh, of defense will go because of the spate of insecurity. The, uh, the, the uh, minister of health will go because of the health crisis that is, is that not being able to manage well. The minister of all right, seems we may have lost uh, Mark Adebayo there. Mr. Ayodele Adio, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, well, uh, just before we get uh, Mark Adebayo back... I think uh, he's back. Okay. Uh, okay, all right. So just before we get uh, Mark Adebayo back, um, I want you to, you know, quickly just uh, uh, start with uh, setting agenda for the new ministers. Um, they have about two years until a new government comes in, so, you know, there's a possibility they might remain or not. Um, but, you know, what would you describe as hitting the ground running, um, um, you know, in, in the, well, the time that they have? In what ways can they achieve the most with the time that they have left? Okay, I think they, they, they actually even have less than two years. And realistically, realistically, I, I really don't know how much time they have to implement anything meaningful. Um, because you know, after nine, nine, ten months, it's it's going to be politics all the way. So I'm not sure they have enough time um, to implement or achieve anything meaningful. Um, for the power sector, like I said, all the new minister needs to do um, is to follow the roadmap that was already laid down, which is the power sector recovery plan, um, and to see to the implementation of some of the areas that have lagged behind over the last two, three years, um, to see that. You know, um, the counterpart funding from the World Bank, like I said, $2.5 billion comes through. Um, and so many other reforms um, that were targeted, you know, at expanding the power sector and opening it up to investment, um, increasing power supply and making the sector more financially viable. Um, those things need to be done. Yeah, I mean, he might not be able to, um, to, to get carried over the line because it's going to be a short period. But I think it's important for them to begin to implement uh, many of those ideas and initiatives. For the agricultural sector, um, I would argue that um, the challenges there are quite robust. I, I'm not even sure where he's going to start from. Um, there hasn't been um, a clear-cut plan or agenda um, the last um, two, three years. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm more confused as to what to even recommend where he starts from because it's, it's a really chaotic situation. Food prices are going up across the entire country. Um, farmers can't access their farms, which is largely due to security. Um, you know, produce are not getting to markets. Um, the value chain is completely broken. Um, people are suffering from exporting um, some agricultural products. Um, Investments so in mechanized agriculture also. Uh, we don't seem to have had a lot of that. Oh, yes, yes. So that's why I said the challenge in the agricultural sector is huge because it's largely, it's, it, it's still largely uh, 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 hose and cutlasses and not mechanized farming, uh, um, you know, which doesn't create the kind of jobs um, and wages that are important to lift people out of poverty. 
And there has to be a gamut of policy support to actually drive the agricultural sector to tie it to industrialization, to tie it to exports and all of that. And I don't think that can be done um, in, in a one-year period. So he has my sympathies, actually, um, in the agricultural sector, because I don't know what he's going to do in the next one year. Mm. Really, trust me, I really don't know. He has my sympathies. Um, really, I am just reminded of um, statements that um, Nigerian food exports, you know, have basically been banned because of, you know, the found agrochemicals in them, you know, talking about that, the fact that farmers have not been properly trained on how to use these chemicals um, because they have um, standards when it comes to food that gets imported into their countries, you know, but uh, and when they're, sent, when they're subjected to checks, they don't pass those checks. Food leave in Nigeria cannot make it into other countries. And I, it really got me wondering, what then has been the quality of the food we've been consuming here? Because nobody's really putting any check on these food items. We just consume them without knowing exactly um, the, you know, the, the, what's contained in those food items regarding chemicals and harmful substances. But I want us to look at you know, this situation with our agricultural sector to consider the irony of the fact that we're coming from, you know, when you look at, you know, pre-colonial era, how we're coming from, you know, an agriculture-based economy to one that has now become dependent on oil and how much agriculture seems to be regressing in Nigeria despite our huge agricultural potential. And what really um, the new administration, let's even look forward to 2023 and beyond, what the new administration need to do to, to, you know, to shake that up in the agricultural sector. Okay. Uh, Listen, there's a whole lot of work that needs to go in the entire value chain of the agricultural sector. And you need probably like a 10-year, 15-year roadmap for you to begin to see um, some sort of tangible re um, results. First of all, you have to realize that the agricultural market is some sort of a global market, um, wherein if you rely on the primary products, which is the yams or the cocos that you produce, um, you're going to leave your farmers in a, in a um, inadvertently poor because those prices are controlled by the international market um, wherein you now have um, countries in the European Union and United States that used to be our biggest markets also subsidizing their farmers or their local farmers for political reasons and so once you subsidize the farmers in the international market it becomes impossible for our local uh, producers to be able to compete in that kind of global environment and then they end up, you know, getting poorer and poorer over the years. Uh, so what we have experienced in the agricultural sector is that while about 11 million people are presently operating in that sector, many of them are operating at the subsistence level and many of them are extremely poor. Uh, so for me, what needs to happen is for us to be able to tie the agricultural sector first to mechanize it, um, support it with robust research and development, and then critically tie it down um, to an industrialization policy um, that moves us not from the primary products into more processing of these primary products and into industrialization process where we can create meaningful jobs um, with better wages, uh, better opportunities. We also need to support our export industries. We are the hegemon in the West African region. Uh, and rather than importing from Cotonou, Niger, and countries in the sub-region, the Nigerian government should actually be exporting and dominating the markets in the West African region. But for us to do that, we need a set of policy objectives that makes exporting agricultural products or our value um, added agricultural process, uh, products easier, um, cheaper, efficient, and effective. Uh, and that has to do with choosing policies wisely um, and smartly um, by first having a clear route plan and a clear agenda. Uh, and I hope that uh, from 2023, we can have a clear roadmap to fundamentally move the agricultural sector away from the subsistence level into a more mechanized uh, level, tie it down to an industrialization policy and support, support it with a robust research and development industry from universities and institutes of agriculture um, so that we can begin to make sensible progress in that particular sector. All right. Um, Ms. Adelaide, I, I also want you to speak on, um, you know, this, you know, I, I am, one of the things that you mentioned earlier is, you know, not even knowing a lot of these ministers and who they are. And I saw, you know, a couple of the reactions to, you know, this news online, you know, there's a lot of people saying, oh, I've never even heard about Salim Aman before, or, um, you know, the Nanono uh, name, you know, um, they're not familiar because they don't seem to have, you know, made a lot of impact. Um, and so talking about impact, 
Do you think or would you say that these uh, two ministries were the most urgent uh, for the current administration? The newspapers say that, you know, it's maybe a start, you know, and there's other ministries that would also be touched. Um, but do you think that power and agriculture were the most urgent for President Mohamed Bouhari to take action with? Or are there others that, you know, he probably would have also added to this list or started, um, you know, his uh, reshuffle with? I just play a very quick joke with you now. Uh, can you in two seconds tell me the Minister of Defense, the name of the Minister of Defense? Um, I was going to say Bashar. Um, <laughs> oh, I normally would know. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there, there, there are lots of, there are lot of I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. There are a lot of ministries that are underperforming, right? Um, uh, the Ministry of Defense is quite... It's like an urgent ministry for me because of the rising insecurity across the country. Um, there's too many bloodletting, too many deaths, too many unavoidable kidnappings. Um, our schools are so vulnerable. Uh, it seems like we don't have a tactical response to anything. Um, I'm, there was the news yesterday that 70 children were kidnapped somewhere, I think in Zamfara State or so. Yes. We just wake up to bad news every day. Uh, and we were supposed to have a minister of defense. You know, I mean, so... Really, I can go on and on on, on, on all these ministries. Uh, Ministry of Education, I'm not sure what is happening at the Ministry of Education. I, I'm not sure what is happening um, at the Ministry of Police Affairs. It, it's, it's, it's just a whole lot of ministries that are, that are quite underperforming. And uh, we can have an entire program you know, about that. And it, it's, just, it's just sad. So when you say that which other ministries are urgent, I think 80% of the ministries are urgent um, for a change and fresh legs. Um, you know, there are just less than five, six, seven ministers who are really doing the job. And the change is required, you know, in broad scale. Unfortunately, we don't really have enough time. It's just one year um, to go. And I, and I don't know what impact any new minister coming in is going to have in, in, in less than a year. I think we've left it too late. We've left the change too late. We're already on the eighth day of the week. And I'm not sure what real difference changing a minister two, three months from now will really make um, the scheme of things. Okay, and, and, and you, where would you say the uh, president's uh, uh, mindset is, you know, with a move like this? Well, I mean, I don't know. Um, um, never spoken to the president. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really, I can't even say how his mind works with things like this any longer. But um, I, I think in, in these two ministries, I think because he, he, he the president seems to have a thing for agriculture, um, um, and he's paid attention to that sector because every time you hear him speak, he talks about farmers and he talks about the agricultural sector. And, and so I would, I would imagine that he had paid close attention to that ministry and he hasn't seen the kind of results that he wants to see and he's probably uh, wielded the big stick. Um, so to that extent, I think he's acted in the ministry that is close to his heart and made a very quick decision. Um, you know, for the power sector, um, uh, I, I don't know. I think he probably felt that um, the minister wasn't doing as much as he had seen uh, when the previous minister, um, Fashola, was in charge of power, and maybe he needed fresh legs, uh, you know. But it is really hard to, to tell you what the president um, thinks on issues like this because he speaks very less um, on many of these issues, and it's hard to predict or... or, or or comment on what he thinks about many of these issues. So, yes, we hear you when you say, you know, it's two years, less than two years. You won't know exactly what you would achieve in less than two years. But the presidency has said that the few cabinet changes, you know, mark the beginning of a total continuous process. Um, so would you would you finally say better late than never? Uh, yeah, I think Mr. Adibayo is back. I think I can see him on the screen. Um, just to point that out. Um, um, yeah, better late than never, obviously. Better late than never. But I think the truth is, the truth is, I'm not sure um, what... You, you're not going to be able to reinvent the wheel in one year. You will not be able to set out a new course, um, set out a new policy plan, implement it, and achieve anything meaningful in one year. Um, which is why I said initially um, that except there is a clear policy agenda on ground and that all the new minister needs to do is to support and implement that plan.
and um, putting a lot more energy and vigor in implementing that sensible idea, um, you're really not going to achieve anything in, in one year. It's, it's, you just have essentially one year to turn the ministry around. Yeah. And I think it's going to be impossible. It's going to be impossible to do. Mm -hmm. The um, People's Democratic Party has also criticized this. Uh, they've said that you know it's uh, a waste of time. And this, you know, really wouldn't achieve much. Uh, um, so you're not the only one with uh, similar thoughts uh, with regards to this. And then there's also people who have said that, you know, this may not really be because of underperformance. It might just be politics being played uh, here and there. Um, would you, you know, maybe, you know, buy into those sentiments? Well, uh, to be honest with you, uh, politicians are in the trade of playing politics, right? So you shouldn't expect anything less from politicians. It's their trade to play politics. And, and um, they make political decisions. Um, um, it shouldn't surprise us, neither should it shock us, because they, they are politicians. Um, the only thing is that uh, whatever political decisions that they make, um, our argument is that it must be in the interest of the Nigerian people or the majority of the Nigerian people. Um, and that's why in the media and in civil society, we constantly are on their necks to make them make the right decisions and the sensible decisions. And so that even if you want to make political decisions, um, um, you, should, you should appoint competent people in your political party or who have political affiliations to your political party into these positions um, of authority. Um, so yes, uh, of course it's a political decision, um, but we, we can only hope and we can only ensure and continue to demand that that political decision that was made is in the interest of the majority of the Nigerian people. And if they do not perform to the extent that we expect, uh, we should also raise our voices to the rooftop to either demand their resignation um, um, or also criticize the president because the book um, essentially stops at the state.